Originally, I thought of just doing two groups of songs, so one group by Stian Hamud and one by Sibelius. And I tried this out and I realized that the second half of the program after Dichte Liebe was a little bit too heavy. It was, um, it was just a groupings of songs and I needed to have something that could stand up to the perfection, to the magnitude of the Dichte Liebe song cycle itself. So I chose songs by other composers as well, from uh, some Greek songs, Schoberg, uh, Alvien, and mixed them up and created a sort of a landscape that in a way mirrors what the Dichterliebe does in the first half of the program. Oh, cool. 
I simply chose the songs that mean a great deal to me, uh, both from the poetry and from the music. And I tried to uh, create a continuum by using keys that work well together, by varying the speeds of the songs so that it doesn't become boring, you know, one slow song after, after another. And in a way, I just, I just took the format of the Dichte Liebe and tried to emulate it slightly by using all sorts of different northern songs. And I think it's like a mirror image in a way. It's, it's the, the German Dichte Liebe and a Scandinavian Dichte Liebe. The Scandinavian songs are wonderfully interesting and different. It's such a shame that this repertoire is not sung more often, probably because people don't speak uh, Swedish or Norwegian, that they don't look into this wonderful repertoire of Sibelius, Stenhammer, Grieg. Um, but it's very close to the folk tradition always in the, in the Scandinavian repertoire. The trolls are never very far away, and there's always an underlying meaning of something slightly sinister in the Grieg, main van lily that we're doing, um, it's all about a water lily and a girl who wears the water lily on her on her on her dress on her breast. Um, but there's something slightly sinister always underneath. That there's something dangerous lurking, and that's often there in the Scandinavian repertoire. <laughs> Oh. 
Sibelius wrote most of his songs early in his life. They're mostly from the 1890s, which is, uh, seems a long way away since he, since he lived for a, a long time after that. But they're very daring, the, uh, particularly the piano parts are very daring. He um, uses, like in Wilse, which is a, a very lively song we do in the middle of the group, um, he makes the piano stay in, on one chord all the way through, virtually, while the singer is modulating on top, so it gets this, these wonderful clashes. Ifrån vad han vad han tog om de andra vägen. Jag ropar i skogen vad jag kan, men han tystar och låter sig på lägen. Blott inte svara han på fallo och gick inte skratta den skåta. Men himlen är plötsligt en dörr och så blå och vi hör och hör prata. Säg skulle den bunsta ha tagit till min när samtalet går så staccato. Min kärlek, min kärlek har valt sig min sin. Jag har glömt att känna som blåta. Jag ser well, singing in Sweden, of course, is one of the major pastimes. Almost everyone in Sweden sings in a chorus at one point in their lives. Um, also, the language. Is, is wonderful for singing because it's it's dark and yet it's open, sort of like Italian, and it's very rich. And the way that these people, the, the way that they're built, their beautiful teeth, their strong bones, the way that their heads are built uh, is, is um, a great facility for singing. Several countries have this. Wales is the same, Korea is the same. The way that they're built and the way that their mentality works mean that they're a great singing nation.
Hugo Alvén is a very important, one of the important uh, Swedish composers. Wrote lots of different kinds of music, uh, chamber music and, and symphonies. And he was almost or equally as important as Stenhammer was. Um, but he was, in a sense, more popular. And the songs that he wrote have such a, a popular touch to them. They're almost songs that Frank Sinatra could sing. They're almost crooning songs. Uh, of course, Jussi Björling made his songs popular as he did also Emil Schöberg. Lots of these songs were sung in Swedish films. Um, but they have a very popular note to them and are, are very accessible and extremely beautiful. Alvin is wonderful. It's, they're a bit like pop songs. Uh, they're just wonderful tunes expressing very normal, everyday uh, emotions, the normal love songs. Um, and they yes, basically express what I imagine a beautiful cello melody or a beautiful uh, orchestral melody would be. Very simple, but very, very touching. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. 
Kraft und Schönen. Frohen Lünden schön den Frucht der Hölgeten. Sei auf den Schern, wo die Himmeln tänkes, der Fürst der Schüssen Oten Ösgling Stan Hammer, yes, well, he's probably the greatest uh, s uh, Swedish composer. And the song, one of the songs that I've chosen, uh, Iskugen, I know many Swedes say this is, without a doubt, the most perfect song from Scandinavia that was ever written. And it really is, it, it gives the essence of uh, the morality, the essence of the culture, the essence of how much people love nature, all of those things that are, that are really central to Scandinavians are all encapsulated in that one beautiful song. It's fantastic. Tonana was made famous by Jussi Björling. He sang it in virtually all of his concerts and it became a very famous uh, encore of his. And uh, he did what we do too, is actually perform the song twice, uh, in a different way the second time, but uh, because it's such a wonderful tune and the emotions are so special, I think it's good to do it twice. Oh, my God. 
Vadetandrum, which is the last one we do, has an, it's very complicated and very difficult to play, um, but it's a wonderful texture, sort of rippling texture, and the rhythm goes against very much what the, uh, the singer is doing. He obviously liked the, uh, the idea of the clash between the singer to create something really emotional and really interesting. In an opera, you're part of an ensemble, you're part of a, a team, which is wonderful. There's nothing more fun than playing a team sport. But on the other hand, in a recital, you get to be your own boss together with your accompanist. You choose the songs that you want to sing, that you want to present, and you can do it at your own leisure, in your own way, without someone telling you how they want it to be. So that's also very gratifying. And the fact that you sing for a, a more intimate audience, someone who's closer to you, and you have the feeling of, of exchange with them, I find that extremely fun and inspiring. Um, opera very often can be a, a more passive sort of uh, endeavor because you're on the stage and they're way out there, the audience. You don't, they're there, but you can't quite feel them. In, in a recital atmosphere, they're so much closer and, and 
in a way, it's a, it's a very beautiful exchange. that I've learned so much from all the wonderful people I've worked with and rather than just let it sort of sit inside of me I'd rather pass that on if someone can make use of it so I I try and reach out to the next generation give them a helping hand when I can and um, also pass on the things that I've learned from great conductors and accompanists and colleagues. Oh, 
When I started singing, I was quite aware that I didn't have a competitive operatic voice. In other words, I didn't have a large instrument that I could throw around. So I had to uh, explore the other qualities of being a, a singer. And in a way, since I was a cellist when I started out, and, and music has always been my passion, I've always thought of myself primarily as a musician and secondarily as a singer. So I guess that's what I've become, is a singing musician.